I was teasing the guys earlier when they were hooking me up with all of this stuff. And I said, you know, when Jesus fed the 5,000, he didn't have no microphones or nothing. He, he still got the word across. So we're going to be good one way or the other. Amen. I want to welcome you all here that are here uh, in the seats. With wow, we got any first time people here today? Any first timers? Put your hand up. I'm, where, where are they? Don't worry, I'm a, we've been pulling people up on stage. I'm not going to bother you. <laughs> hey, all right, he was sitting down by me. You should have talked to me when I was sitting over there. All right, welcome. Glad to have you. If you're too shy to, uh, to say you're a first-timer, we're still glad to have you here. For those of you that are watching online, certainly glad to have you watching. We, we have people that have transitioned or left here, gone other places or whatever, and they still tune in. So we're very thankful that you think enough to take a little bit of your time out to share with us. Um, I get a chance to start a new series, which isn't too often. Um, wasn't even supposed to be preaching today, so I hope God does a move. Today is Andrea's birthday, so... Uh, It's her sacrifice. Uh, it was like, guess what? Your birthday, I got to preach, but that's okay. God's going to do something special. I already did something special. He gave her to me on March 6th. But anyway, enough about us. We're here to talk about encounters, neighboring in the life of Jesus. We're, we're going to be going through this series over the next few weeks, and we're going to talk about certain specific encounters that Jesus had with specific people. You know, Eli was just up here talking about the youth, but he's going to actually uh, also be preaching next week. He's going to be talking about Jesus' encounter with, with Peter and Andrew. And then um, Joe, you know, one of my favorite guys, he's going to be covering the two weeks following that, talking about Jesus' encounter with Nicodemus and then also with the woman at the well. I get to talk about today Jesus' encounter with Zacchaeus. Now, we are we're on a mission. It's been mentioned over and over again, even last month and this month. And we're on a mission to go. And this is part of our mission statement, and it should be a part of every church's mission statement, which it says, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And that's the first part of that verse. But the operative thing here that we talk about is go, going. So the big question that I would pose to you today is, is where do we go? Where do we go? Now, Ron already talked a little bit about this in his communion, if you were paying attention, and he used part of this verse, and it's Acts 1-8-B, and it says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And I put this little target up here so that you can get an idea because a lot of people don't understand exactly what what we're dealing with when we talk about that. But if you look at the first mention of Jerusalem, Jerusalem is right in the middle. It is the home city. It is, it is our community. It's our neighborhood. So this is where we're supposed to go. This is where we start. This is where we start. I'm going I'm to dig into this uh, more and more a little bit as we get along. Because all of us live in certain neighborhoods and all of us have neighbors. The extent to where we interact with them can be transformational if we allow it. So, so I'm hoping that what you will learn today, if you're kind of like me and you, you really don't reach out, you're not an extrovert and you can live next to somebody for three or four years and not talk to them, Maybe you're going to make that, that first step because in preaching this, quite frankly, I couldn't preach this without having to make it work for myself, right? So that means that I personally have to do a better job of reaching my neighbor. We look at what Matthew says here, and we look at the term neighbor, and it says, Matthew 22, 37 through 40, love 
the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. You remember a scenario that this took place in with the rich young ruler was, was asking Jesus, how do I inherit heaven? And, and he says, you know, what are, what's the greatest law? Just love God and love your neighbor. So then the question comes up with, who is your neighbor? Who is your neighbor? And then he went into the parable of the Good Samaritan in understanding how all of these people passed by the Samaritan because he was somebody that was a little bit different. Nobody actually took the time to deal with him except for the one person that was totally opposite of him, but he showed the love of God and helped him along. But this is going to hit probably a little bit different today as I go through this situation and talking about how we interact with our neighbors. Now, anybody remember this show? I, I'm, Ron was teasing me about how old I was today, and I, I kind of date myself, but, you know, when I was a kid, you know, there was this show on called Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And, you know, the deal about Mr. Rogers, you know, he was such a great guy. Everybody got along in his neighborhood, and, and it was the perfect utopia, right? You know, everything was always good. You know, I don't even I don't even remember if they had a thunderstorm or anything like that happening to Mr. Rogers <laughs> during all of those years. But you know, this I, I think he 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 gave us a misconception here as to what what the neighborhood was. Perfect utopia. I, I looked this up. It says in a perfect utopian society, everyone gets what they need because communication, understanding and open-mindedness of different ideas would be key. How much of that do we have? In order for society to be a utopia, everyone has to be comfortable and provided with their wants and needs, and everything needs to function perfectly. Can't, we don't have too much of a utopia right now, do we? Anybody live in a neighborhood that's a perfect utopia? As a matter of fact, as we have progressed, I'm going to throw some stuff at you. Has anybody in here, you don't have to raise your hand, but you can be honest. Has anybody here, as you have observed your neighborhood, looked at something going on and you said the phrase, there goes the neighborhood? <laughs> you might not have said it, but you might have thought it. What do you mean by saying, there goes the neighborhood? It, yeah, somebody says, change it. Y'all can talk to me. Come on now. I mean, this ain't a predominantly black church, but y'all can act like it is. Y'all can talk to me. <laughs> now, it, it, you know, just, let's just be honest with each other. We, we see somebody, you know, coming to, or a certain culture coming, and, and they move into a home, and oh, there goes the neighborhood. Because your idea, you moved here because you thought that this might be your perfect little utopia, and everything is good, and you're checking out the nice picket fences and the dog, and, you know, this, the, the little kids over here, and then somebody comes in that's a little bit odd, a little bit different, and, oh, man, there goes the neighborhood. Because the change that you're afraid might take place is going to ruin your idea of a perfect utopia. And then you have the total opposite of the there goes the neighborhood and somebody says, hey man, you don't know me, I grew up in the hood. Another concept of what the neighborhood is, what do you think about if somebody says, I grew up in the hood? Huh? The ghetto, poverty, what? Drugs. Or oh, somebody said New York. <laughs> Not that, the whole part. <laughs> so, you know, what I want to get at is that we all have different ideas about what a neighborhood is or what our neighborhood is. Some people affectionately call their old neighborhood the hood because it is a place that they were comfortable with. But everybody has this idea of of, of what the, the neighborhood is. We, 
We're doing this series to give you an idea, basically, of how you need to interact with your neighbor. And the, the point person today that we're going to talk about that was in the neighborhood is this guy called Zacchaeus. Now, I was laughing with, with our elder um, about this song this morning. You, you want to sing this song for us? Everybody knows the Sunday school song? Sing it for us. Loud. Lead, lead everybody. That's pretty good. Now, now, you people that aren't church people, y'all don't know nothing about that song, but, you know, those of us that are church people, we used to sing that song in Sunday school talking about Zacchaeus. He was, he was a short little guy. He wanted to see Jesus, and because he was short and he, he didn't feel he could get his way through the crowd, he actually climbed up in a tree. Now, this is not a parable. This is an actual encounter that happened with Jesus. So what we're going to do is we're going to read about this where it is in Luke 19, 1 through 10. It says here, he entered Jericho and was passing through, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry. And come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, what happened? They all grumbled. Why? Because they said he has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, Half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, today, today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Amen. Yes. <laughs> now, we, we laugh at the Sunday school song and talk about the situation with Zacchaeus being a wee little man. It's kind of a cute little song that, an oddity that someone would climb up the tree to see Jesus. But I want to bring you a little bit closer into the life of Zacchaeus so we can kind of understand what the deal is here. First of all, his occupation was that of a tax collector. You might not think that's such a big deal, but if I say IRS then all of a sudden it's going gonna, it's gonna to slant left. Zacchaeus was IRS, right? Yeah. Now, the deal was Zacchaeus was IRS on steroids <laughs> because in order to be IRS, what you had to do was, you know, you were a Jewish citizen, but you worked for the Romans. You worked for the government that was over you. Okay, so you're not only an IRS, but you're a sellout. Okay. Because what he had to do in that regard was work for the Roman government to collect taxes from his own people. So y'all don't like it every year when the IRS says by April the 15th, y'all got to turn in these paperwork and stuff like that. What if they actually banged on your door and said, hey, it's time to pay the taxes? So Zacchaeus was that guy. He was the IRS he actually came to you. He had to physically collect taxes from you. Now, he was a rich tax collector. What does that mean? He was taking money off the top. He was crooked. If the Romans said, I want you to get $100 from this person, I don't know what they use, denarii or whatever the thing is, the money. Zacchaeus was said, hey, I come to collect taxes and you need to pay me $150. You had to pay what Zacchaeus was asking you. You had no say-so in whether or not, well, my bill says it's 100 and you asked for 150 so, you know, no. You didn't have any choice. You had to give him what he asked for. Collecting off of the top was the way he got rich. Okay? 
So he was the IRS. He was the IRS on steroids. He was dishonest IRS. And then the other thing, worst of all, he was short. <laughs> he come walking to the street, and you look at the and oh, man, here come that old short man. He's going to come and take all of my money. You know, people tease short people for whatever reason. I don't know. But that actually added to the ridicule that he faced. When you think about it, yeah, he was rich. He was, he was living a life of luxury. You know, he, he probably had a, a, one of the biggest houses in the city. You know, the people have a Napoleon complex, I call them when they're short. They, they tend to project a whole lot more than other people just to prove something. And because he had authority, he probably did not have good encounters with a lot of people. So the people themselves had a very bad image of this guy. Very bad image. Not good encounters had they had with this guy, Zacchaeus. Now, you can't put all that into a little Sunday school song and understand what's really happening here. But yet and still, you have a situation with the encounter with Jesus. Zacchaeus apparently had heard about Jesus. He heard Jesus was coming. He wanted to see what all of this ruckus was about. So, because he's short, if people can't get you one way, they'll get you the other. Well, here come that old short dude. Let's block him off so he can't see. You know, and he, you know, he had to avoid the people. He had to get out of the crowd. People might have used an excuse to, to push him or, or insult him or something, but he avoided the crowd and he got up in a tree so he could see this Jesus. And he got something that he wasn't expecting. Because when he got up in the tree, he thought he was looking for Jesus, but Jesus was looking for him. Jesus looked up in the tree and said, hey, dude, come down. We're going to have a party at your crib today. <laughs> and he was like, I'm adding to the story. Me? You want to come to my house? You're a great teacher. I've heard some things about you. They say that you may even be the son of God, and you want to come to my house. This is a way that Zacchaeus had not been treated by any of the people that are around him. As a matter of fact, they avoided him. They ridiculed him. But here it is, the greatest teacher, the son of God, says, I'm coming to your house today. So he's like, yes, yes. Somebody accepts me, somebody that Jesus has with Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, and they do just what the church does. They do just what the church does. Jesus is supposed to be a great teacher, the Son of God, and he is going to hang out with this sinner and all of his friends tonight. Maybe he's not all he cracked up to be. Maybe he's not the one. Maybe he's not the Messiah because certainly a great religious man isn't going to hang out with people like that. He's not going to hang out with those people. Yet and still, Jesus encountered Zacchaeus, and then what happened? Doesn't go into all of the detail about the conversation or anything, but something changed because Jesus not only saw Zacchaeus, but he encountered him close up. And his life changed. Anyone that encounters Jesus and truly encounters Jesus and truly sees Jesus for who he is, you know something? Life is going to change. And what happens in their life that causes a change is going to reflect by the way that they turn and do something differently. So Zacchaeus says, you know what? I ripped off all of these people. But what I'm going to do, because I have now encountered Jesus, is I'm going to go back. And I'm going to give them everything that I took from them. And for everybody that I cheated, I am going to return fourfold what I took from them. An encounter with Jesus changed him. It turned him into a different person. Now, we don't hear anything else about what happened 
after that as far as Zacchaeus is concerned. But we do know that that change was transformational. And what we need to do in this example is understand as far as relationships go, we cannot separate our relationship with God from our relationship with others. <laughs> you know, church people tend to do that a lot. Historically, religion has used God to justify the mistreatment of other people. I want you to think about it. Some of the greatest wars that were fought through history were religious wars. They've used God to justify mistreatment of other people. I put this in your bulletins, and if you want to, you can read along, but I want to read you something that speaks to this in separating our relationship with God from our relationship with others. It comes from Matthew 5, 44, 48. And it says this, and the theme is love your enemies. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies. Now, I want to stop there for just a second because when you think about it, you know, us good Christian people think, we don't, we don't really have enemies. We love everybody. But yeah, we have enemies. And you know, it would be very unusual if you did not have an enemy because God gives us wisdom enough to know those people that love us and those people that are out to hurt us. People, some people are out to hurt us. They're our enemies, but we still are supposed to love them. And I think with all of the stuff, the, the hype that's going on in the news and social media, we misinterpret actually who our enemies are. Because a lot of the people that we deem to be our enemies, we never even met face to face. And until we actually meet them face to face, we will not understand that sometimes... They actually are pretty good people. It says, let me, let me go back again. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemies, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven, for he causes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward would you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? And if you only greet your own brothers and sisters, what are you doing out of the ordinary? Don't even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. We talked about Christians being perfect. We can only be perfect within Jesus Christ because we know that we are failures ourselves. But when we cloak ourselves with the love that he has for us, that he gives to us, then nothing is seen but Jesus. And when they look at Jesus, something changes. If people can see Jesus and us, something changes. And our interaction with us is going to change. And that's where that perfection takes place. Think about this. We can't come to any reconciliation by practicing avoidance. Uh, Augustinian monk Thomas Kempis wrote, All men desire peace, but, the, but very few desire those things that make for peace. Practicing avoidance. What do you mean by that? We might not cause any trouble in our own neighborhood. We might not, you know, um, rat on people or give them any problem or whatever, but we keep away from them. And even if it's not in our neighborhood, let me throw something at, at us church people. Because we are so holier than thou, we do a great job of practicing avoidance because what avoidance, what we do is separate ourselves from those people. I don't want my kid to go to those schools. I'm going to put them in this school. I don't want to live in that neighborhood. I'm going to go into this gated community. And you go into the gated community, one of those people move into the gated community, and you've got to keep moving. It doesn't work. Jesus tells us that we have to go. We are to be the salt and the light within our communities. If there is no salt and light, then the community does not change. If we avoid the community, the community stays dark. 
And we had a whole bunch of little light candles over here in, in Wildwood every Sunday morning. And we all praise Jesus, you know, he's so good. I'm so blessed. And we go into our communities and we don't do anything to impact those people that so desperately need us, those people that we talk about all the time because we want to avoid them. Y'all quiet this morning. I hope I'm not stepping on any toes. We can't demonstrate sacrificial love by merely tolerating, merely tolerating those who are different. Eastern religions basically have this philosophy of do no harm, just be chill, you know, don't, don't upset anything. But we don't do religion when we encounter Jesus. We do relationship. And what that means and what we are called to do is to seek the well-being of not just what happens here at Wildwood, but we seek the well-being of our neighborhoods and our communities and our cities and our state and our nation and then the world. That's that circle of Ju Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and other most parts of the world. We as a people of Christ need to seek the well-being of others, whether they are the same color, whether they're the same political party, whether you like their football team or not, we are to seek the well-being of others, the greater good of others. Y'all with me? I don't know. We're called to go. We are called to go. We're called to value likenesses over differences. We're called to value others over self. What do you mean by we're called to value likenesses over differences? Bear with me. I'm going to read some more Bible to you if y'all don't mind. I didn't want to preach this off of my head because I always mess up, so I put it on paper. But I want you to listen to what I'm saying here. Humanly speaking, Christians are very diverse. We come from every nation or tribe and people group. We speak different languages. We have a bunch of different skin tones, and we reflect different cultures and social classes. But for all who are members of Christ's family, race, rank, and gender lose their significance. You hear me? Race, rank, and gender lose their significance. It says in Galatians, there's neither Jew or Greek, neither slave nor free. There's neither male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Amen. Everybody that comes to Jesus comes to him the same way. They come to him by grace, through faith, and repentance from sin. To say we're all one in Christ, it, 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 it covers a lot because it calls for unity and harmony among us brothers and sisters in Christ. I talk about it all the time. We got to start at home. We don't really have unity and harmony here. We don't have unity and harmony among Christians. We got a bunch of different denominations, a bunch of different churches in all kinds of neighborhoods and stuff like that. I, I gave y'all the neighborhood sermon two or three times a year. I talk about every community has a church, a Chinese restaurant, and a liquor store. And most communities have more churches than they have Chinese restaurants and liquor stores, but the Chinese restaurants and the liquor stores impact the community more than the church does. What's wrong with that? We can embrace our differences. We can even celebrate them as long as above all we clothe ourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. The unity Christ prayed for is not an organizational unity or denominational unity, but a spiritual unity based on faith in Christ and the glory of God within. Christian harmony is not based on the externals of the flesh, but the internals and internals of the spirit and the inner person. We must look beyond the elements of what we see on the outside, the differences in each other. Discrimination, prejudice, and racism have existed in every generation, but there's no room for such bias in our family, in the family of God. Paul says, 
For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. Christians should be united in passion, plan, and purpose, just as the Father and Son are united in the same. Christians are all treasure-bearing earthen, earthen vessels. Christians are all redeemed by the same blood. We are all going to the same heaven, and we have a shared aspiration, and we also have a shared enemy, and it ain't whoever's in the White House. It is a spiritual enemy called Satan. Most importantly, we have a shared hope and a shared joy. Do we not? Yes. I want to introduce you to some guys. I've talked to you all about my Thursday night group. These are my Zoom guys. This is a unique situation. You see four old men up here. But the funny thing is, we all grew up in the same neighborhood. The guy standing behind me, George, he and I were in first grade together. The guy um, standing in the back, Ron, he's a Lutheran pastor in Chicago. We played Little League Baseball together. We went to, uh, we started out together in third grade. The guy that I'm sitting next to, Steve, and Steve and I joke about each other. We played basketball together in high school, and I showed y'all that basketball picture when I was doing the slam dunk. But uh, Steve was my first little white buddy, my first white friend. We started out together in the third grade. What we talk about, we, we, this was a picture we took last year. It was the first time that all four of us had been together in 45 years. And what brought us together was the pandemic. Um, off and on, we had not talked to or seen each other in years and years. And the pastor, the Lutheran pastor, Ron, uh, we, we were Facebook friends, loosely connected, and Ron said, you know what, guys? And this was right, right when the pandemic was hitting, George F Floyd's situation was hitting, everything was going crazy in the world. And Ron said, you know, how would you guys like to connect? How would you like to get together on a Zoom call? You know, because I'm in Florida, George and Steve are in South Carolina, Ron's in Chicago. How would y'all like to get together on a Zoom call? Because what I'm curious about is we got along as kids, we still are connected to each other over all these years, but with all of this going on in the world, how did this happen? Because what the world is telling us is that we should be separate and we should hate each other. And over the last couple of years when we connected, usually every Thursday night, we talk about what's happening in the world. We talk about our differences. We, we actually have uncovered some stuff about each other because um, George standing behind me, he's, he's light-skinned, but he's a black guy. <laughs> And um, segregation threw us together because I had to go to a white school when I was in elementary school, and that was where Steve, uh, Steve and Ron and I met our first encounters with each other and faced a lot of prejudice. It turned out because we connected in classrooms and we liked each other. I mean, kids are kids. Steve said, hey, might they call me Sam. Hey, Sam, I want you to come to my house. Okay. We lived close enough to walk to each other's house. His parents welcomed me into their home. I had a basketball hoop in my yard, and I said, hey, Steve, come to my house. We can play some ball. He'd come to my house. My mom welcomed him into our home. But what happens is a lot of times when our kids interact and their difference, kids don't know any difference. They just want to play. They just want to love each other. And here we are with our adults and all of our idiosyncrasies and our differences. And, our, and what we're scared of is we say, little Johnny, I don't want you to go over to those people's house. I don't want you to play with, with, with those people. They're not good people. And, and, and that's embedded in the kid's head. And they grow up with these ideas. And they end up turning up into Republicans and Democrats. But somehow, with all of our differences, we stay together. We love and we respect each other, and we look forward to meeting with each other. Let me, let me, let me dig into this a little further. Two of us, Ron, he's been a Lutheran pastor now for going on 25, 30 years up in Chicago. 
when we connected, uh, I did not know that he had turned into a pastor. Uh, he did not know that I had turned into a preacher. George and Steve, they don't even go to church. They don't want to go to church because their encounter with church was negative. Steve was hurting, and he would tell me to this day. Now, they may be watching. I sent him the link. I said, y'all watch me preach. Ron, I'd say, Ron, put this on at your church. You won't have to work this morning. You, people can see. <laughs> but Steve said, Sam, he calls me. He says, Sam, Chris, you know, what I saw in church wasn't what the Bible says. It wasn't what Jesus taught. And every time I went, I saw a bunch of negative, hypocritical people. As a matter of fact, if you came to a couple of my churches, they wouldn't even want you in there. George, whole different situation. George is gay. He is married to his husband. George grew up in the church. And when he started coming of age and he was trying to discover who he was and this began to come out, the church kicked, well, I didn't say they kicked him out, but they became cold and distant to him and pretty much made him not feel welcome. Now, I'm not saying because we four are all together, we all believe the same and we, we, you know, we don't all believe the same. We have disagreements. But what we do have in commonality is love for each other and a respect for where we came from in our neighborhood. Because not only we were able to build that bridge and cross cultural differences, but our parents were open-minded enough to allow us to build that bridge and cross cultural differences. So what that allows the four of us to do is to be able to see what's going on in the world and say, you know what, there needs to be some salt and light out there in the world. There needs to be some people, other people that are willing to build a bridge and say, just because I don't believe what you believe or I don't like what you like doesn't mean we can't talk and work it out. Amen? We're called to go. We're called to value likenesses over differences. We're called to value each other over self. Jesus called Zacchaeus. Jesus overlooked his sin because it says he seeks and he saves that who are lost. Jesus made a change in his heart. He's calling us to do the same, and we can only do that by our interaction. So if there's something that we need to do with nothing else we need to do today, I am calling you to do this. And when, when Joe and I were coming up with the sermon series and things and we have the meeting, we want to give you a simple challenge to do, something that you really can do. Go and meet one neighbor you haven't talked to in your neighborhood because it's going to work out. Because this is what the rest of that verse tells us. It says, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to, all observe, to observe all that I've commanded you. But I left this first part out earlier. I did it on purpose. And it says, and behold, I am with you always to the end. Ron talked about it today. He left us a helper. I want you to pray about who it is you might need to build a bridge toward, who it is you might need to talk to. Let me tell you something about my neighborhood. They told me not to do this, but I'm kind of stupid anyway. And I, I've told some of you about this before. I preached about it. The guy in my neighborhood around the corner that, that, that hung a black doll from his tree on a noose. And I had to go speak to him and ask him why he did that. It turned out it was an innocent representation, as he said, of Halloween. And I, I kind of gave him a mulligan for that. But when I talked to him, it wasn't a negative conversation at all. It was a positive conversation. And he did what most people say, some of my best friends are black. I know y'all say that just to, you know, <laughs> make us feel better. But, you know, it was still a positive conversation. It opened the door to the point that we can now still have a conversation with each other. My neighbor across the street who, in protest of the election, hung his flag upside down which is, it means, it says so much negative. When you actually, it's actually illegal. You can't hang a flag upside down. But he hung his flag upside down. 
and had to walk across the street and say, hey, Larry, why you hang your flag upside down? It says, this, this means that your life is in danger. And quite frankly, I want to make sure that you're not sending me a signal. Well, you know, what's going on? My life is in danger. And you know, I had to hear all that. But, you know, we are right. We're good people. I'm not mechanical. He fixes all of my broken stuff and doesn't charge me anything. You know, we have that relationship. I don't care what flag they're waving outside their house. Don't let that be a signal or a barrier to stop you from building a bridge and going and just talking to them, just sharing your heart. God's with you. He's with you. Let the love of Jesus be reflected. Pray before you do that. Let the love of Jesus be reflected in your interaction with your neighbors. And most importantly, as I always do, you might not know anything about this love of Jesus, or you might not have him as a part of you. That means you have no protection. You have no comforter. You have no inner peace. If something's bothering you and you can't quite cross that bridge, I'm going to ask you today, don't leave this church without getting to know him. If there are people up here that, that want to come to intercept our uh, prayer and you need prayer, whether you know Jesus or not, if you want to talk to us, we want to talk to you. We want to make that first connection here with you today because this is the best place. And if you came here and you have an opportunity to see Jesus, we want to introduce you to him right now. And we always have the waters of baptism ready right now. We got robes, towels, everything. Y'all want to get in there? We, we, we'll take you. We've done it plenty of times before, and we're going to do it plenty of times again. But if you're ready to look, if you came here to look over and see Jesus, I'm hoping you saw him today, and I hope that he's speaking to your heart. Please come up front and let us know. We're here to welcome you if you need prayer. We're here to welcome you and pray with you. We're here to talk to you. Most importantly, we're here to let you get a glimpse of Jesus. Thank you all for the opportunity to speak to you today. I love you all. Pray for us. Go change the world.